everybody to, I think this is our fourth new member webinar. And um, tonight's instructor is our very own Nathan Moody, who I'm sure you're going to enjoy because we always do. So Nathan, I'm gonna let you sort of take it away and talk about what you're gonna talk about. And uh, um, if you want people to sort of just kind of blurt out when they have, they have questions, we can do that. If you'd rather they hold um, until uh, you let them know it's a good time to ask questions, we can do that too, that's up to you. And just one thing, if we do get Zoom bombed and we have to turn it down, then I'm gonna put uh, a new link on the calendar because not everybody uh, can get email. Some people get it in digest form, they won't get it through Buzz until too late. So there you go, Nathan. Well, Steve, yours. can we, can we remind people to mute themselves when they're not actually asking a question or something that's helpful? Good point. Hi. Um, well, where do we start? Um, we're going to start by saying that I am not the end all be all of expedition people, um, but I've done enough to have some opinions. Um, I am looking at Zoom right now and most of the people I see on screen have done more expeditions than I have. So um, this was really just to set expectations. This is really oriented towards newer members who might be curious about like, what does it take to live out of a kayak for a week or more? And uh, what are the some, what are some of the considerations uh, that one might want to um, keep in mind while preparing, while gearing up, while choosing a boat, while packing while food planning, all of that good stuff. So uh, it's gonna be, my goal for this session is to keep it pretty high level because everyone wants something different out of an expedition, whether it's wanting to go somewhere remote to play or it's going somewhere remote just to chill or really putting on miles day, day after day and having more of an, uh, an endurance uh, experience. So it's gonna be pretty high level, uh, but I'm also gonna to try to keep it really short so that uh, at the end, we can do two things. First, we can make sure that newer members ask questions they didn't feel were adequately explained during the presentation or follow on questions that come to mind. But most importantly too, because this is a club making sure that anyone else who's a member who has lots of expedition experience can also uh, land their expertise. General thumbs up. Does that sound like an okay way to proceed for the next half hour? Sweet. Thank you all for joining. So kayak expeditions, I assume, uh, can everyone just give a general nod if you guys can see my shared screen? Sweet. Um, there's less text than this, I promise. Um, so <clears throat> what I'm gonna, how I organize this is it to planning, gear, food, and packing? And um, there's a lot of things to cover under each, so we will just dive in. We're gonna do these in this order. So when it comes to planning, um, one of the most important things to do is really figure out what kind of trip do you want? Do you want something that's really endurance focused? Do you want something that's pleasurable and chill? Do you want something where you go set up camp for a week, don't move and just relax? Or do you want to have a different campsite every single day? And a lot of this is less about local knowledge. It's less about having a chart for a specific area. It's about aligning expectations for what kind of paddle you want to do and what kind of paddle you want to engage with, with your companions. Um, once that's figured out, then of course the detail planning really comes into play. You can see Tom, Ellen, Krista, and I in this photo with charts. And we had lots of charts for this particular expedition. This was off uh, the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, but you also see that we are in a settlement in this photo. And so it's one thing to look at guidebooks, to uh, get charts for the area and all that good stuff. The other really important thing is to leverage local knowledge. And people in the areas that you're going to be paddling in are usually more than happy to tell you where you're wrong. 
And um, it's, uh, it's also a really great way to connect to people who live there. And it really gives you a sense to immerse into the local culture or the local kind of vibe, whether it's in Mexico or Thailand or uh, even somewhere in, uh, on the coast of California. Um, we already talked about this a little bit, but it's really important to, to align on goals and expectations. Where, how far do we want to go in a certain day? In a certain day, how hard do we want to paddle? What kind of conditions are we uh, generally willing to accept in terms of getting on the water versus, ooh, this is above everyone's kind of shared agreed upon threshold. Maybe we should spend a day in camp and just relax or read. So I think that. Um, and 90% of human interaction is about expectation management. And nowhere is that more true than on an expedition. So it's really important to make sure that you and everyone you're going with is aligned in terms of where you wanna go and what you wanna do. And it seems kind of obvious, but you'd be surprised how often that can kind of get in the way if that's not really uh, fully considered. A big part of this is risk tolerance. So when you, choose your route, when you choose your, the place you go, when you choose the people that you paddle with, a big part of it is making sure that there's at least a shared baseline of risk tolerance. And that if you are willing to go out in 15 second swell, that's not going to make the person who's never been out in more than 10 seconds swell nervous or um, really uh, uncomfortable. Because uh, last time I checked, I kayak for fun. And the time it stops being fun is where a lot, of, um, a lot of interpersonal issues can come up and a lot of tension can build. And so I think risk, uh, making sure everyone's got a shared understanding of risk tolerance, even if it's different, making sure that people know where people stand is really, really important for good group dynamics. This is actually no different than a paddle on the open bay here at home, but it's just as important in, um, in an expedition. When you go on an expedition, and this again is actually also true for just day paddle planning, you should always have fall forward plans and fall back plans. So here we're on the water actively discussing, hey, like the, the fog lifted, you can see the water is dead calm. Let's fall forward to a goal that we actually hadn't set. Let's push farther than we thought we actually could at the beginning of the day. Um, likewise, the of course, the inverse is more common where you have really crappy conditions and you have to fall back and you have a plan A that you start out with and then you have to fall back to a safer plan B or even plan C or I've been on paddles where we have a plan E and you know, that's life and, and, and that's okay. And that's part of the adventure. So making sure that at the beginning of every day, it's like, here's plan A, here's plan B, if, it's, if the conditions are just rocking and super easy and awesome. And here's a plan F, if things really start to kind of uh, not look so hot. And uh, having that proactive discussion before you get on the water is really critical. And if you're if a lot of you are thinking like, wow, this doesn't sound that different than like just panning up a, a day paddle, you're absolutely right. It's not that different, but making sure that um, uh, these things don't become issues on a multi-day expedition becomes all the more important. So conditions are what drive a lot of these things. Usually for us being kayakers, it's sea state, it's wind, to a lesser, slightly lesser degree, rain. I mean, we can all paddle in the rain, um, but rain really can affect visibility if it's intense. So one of the challenges with an expedition is you often plan these things months in advance. You have no idea what the conditions are gonna be. So how do you manage that? So uh, again, you can leverage local knowledge. This is actually a photograph of a, of a, a whiteboard we found on Vancouver Island. Um, and you can see there's tides and all this other stuff. And tides you can always predict pretty fairly reliably, um, even months in advance, but you certainly can't predict rain. You can predict sunset and sunrise, but you can't predict wind speeds. So uh, the things to leverage in those situations is local knowledge. What are the daily patterns at this time of year? So imagine someone was gonna do 
uh, imagine there was no kind of front country city urban area in the Bay Area. And someone was going to do a backcountry paddle on the inside of the bay during the summertime. And if someone came to you and asked like, hey, what should I worry about in the summertime around here? We'd be like, afternoon winds will just kick your ass every single time. And there are usually those little things that are true all over the world in different ways, whether it's like, oh, if the wind's coming from the south, you're fine. If it's coming from the north, you're screwed. Or if the swell from this direction is fine, that means one thing, but if it's coming from the other direction, it means something else. So leverage local uh, knowledge for sure. And then the other, uh, of course, key is your marine VHF radio if you are expeditioning in the US or Canada, um, where you can get uh, uh, always updated weather reports. When you travel internationally, that gets a little bit trickier. Uh, when we get to the end, it'd be interesting to hear from anyone else in the Zoom call who has had to deal with getting weather reports in really foreign countries. Like I never had to deal with getting weather reports in Thailand, for example. Um, but um, that would be interesting for people to share at the end of the presentation because I would learn from that as well. Um, as you do your expedition, of course, the big thing is the assumption is that an expedition is a multi-night excursion. So you're camping, you're exploring. And so the one of the most important things to figure out is after a day of paddling, where are you going to take out? Where's, where's home for the night? And this is again where uh, looking at weather patterns, leveraging local knowledge, looking at charts can really help you plan what takeouts are safe or convenient. One of the things that we found on the west coast of Vancouver Island, or uh, if you're on the east coast of northern Canada, for example, is um, the slope of the beach really matters because the tidal exchange could be like eight feet, 10 feet more. And so you might land and set up camp and it seems awesome. And then you have a half mile carry to the actual water the next morning. And um, that's a good way to get exercise, but it's not a great way to uh, start your day. So uh, really figuring out what takeouts are pr uh, protected from prevailing winds. Um, uh, I'll you know, leverage the internet for a lot of this stuff because the internet is the best tool all of us have for playing a lot of these expeditions these days. Um, but definitely look at um, what direction the cove or beach faces relative to prevailing wind conditions at that time of year because wind conditions can change uh, time of year to time of year. Um, and this can really make the difference between, oh, okay, we made it. It's the end of the day. We're just going to land and it'll be fine versus oh my God, we just did a whole big burly day and now we have to land through that dumpy surf or, um, you know, wow, that's a long carry from like where the water ends up to the campground. So um, the best you can do to figure that stuff out in, ahead of time is well worth your time. Um, when you land, make sure that your boats are securely stowed. Uh, it, this is not the best photograph for this example, but you might notice that there are some uh, tow lines uh, here in the sand and one at the end of this boat. We would always make sure that our boats were tied off to something that would not float away. And this has been, um, I won't tell any stories on the Zoom call. Others can if they choose to at the end of the uh, presentation. But uh, this is like, this is just belt and suspenders stuff. Just make sure that your boat's there when you wake up in the morning. Um, and just tying off your boat to something that will not move or float away during the night is really, really important. Um, also make sure that once your boats are unloaded, because your expedition, you're gonna have a lot of gear in these things. Make sure it's not somewhere where it's gonna literally get blown off of something. So don't set it up on top of a rock, up on top of a uh, one of these logs because wind can really just toss these things once they're empty and uh, cause potential damage. And you don't want that to happen. Um, campsite selection is also um, not only important, but it's really intensely personal. Um, some people want to uh, just kind of have the vibe of camping in a forest. Others feel more comfortable camping with some space around them on the beach and making sure that you realize that everyone's gonna have their, their preferences for where they might wanna set up camp is, is fine. Um, 
And you can have your tents in completely different areas as long as you've got kind of a, a shared space for meal prep and socialization and stuff. Um, so just be, be flexible around campsite selection. And uh, yeah, most of the people on this call don't need to be told this, but uh, know where the high water line is. Um, and I have camped on Tamales Bay so many times and had even in Tamales Bay, people set up their camps, you know, 20 yards away. And I have to go over to them and say, yeah, you're gonna be wet at two in the morning. You might wanna scooch up the beach a little bit. So that happens to the best of us. So just be always be aware of those things. Um, happy accidents happen. We were on Vancouver Island and we found this fort that someone built or like probably 50 people slowly built over time out of driftwood and detritus. And it was awesome. And we could have we could have camped anywhere, but we took one look at this thing and we're like, yeah, that is the center of our campsite. And so happy accidents in terms of wind breaks, in terms of terrain, in terms of beach shape, all these things really uh, can and do happen. And um, you should definitely take advantage of that stuff when it does, because it can be a real story to tell later on. It can be a real uh, morale boost after a rainy day, finding a spot this kitted out is is pretty sweet um the most important thing of course in terms of group dynamics is communicate uh here we're uh, we're having a family meeting and um it was great because we all uh, took out had a discussion about how things were going what we wanted to do what our goals were for the day how tired were we and we would do this all the time and it was just, it made this trip an absolute joy. And um, it's, it's just the most important thing in a day paddle, in, uh, in, in tackling a rescue situation, even if it's, if you're rock gardening locally, and it's all the more important uh, if you're on an expedition. So just be open and be transparent about how you're feeling and how others are doing. And just be sensitive to that to make sure that the group dynamic isn't pushed to the point of breaking. But we don't care about that. We want to talk about gear. We want to talk about buying stuff, right? Um, so the, um, the thing about gear is that it's really personal. And I, I have some personal preferences that are preferences only. And I'm going to share those with you. And you just have to remember that this is different for everybody. So this is not you know, this is not gospel. This is absolutely Nathan's personal take and that's okay. So this is a boat that I lived out of for uh, two weeks on Vancouver Island. It's a QCC. And I like this boat for reasons I'll get into in a moment uh, for expeditioning, um, but with some compromises, you can see that it has basically no rocker. It has an almost plumb bow. So if I got to a location, that's awesome, but I can't exactly like play a location or play terrain in a boat like this. This is going to take me from point A to point B super fast and very efficiently and do basically nothing else. But on the flip side of that, it provides me huge amounts of gear storage and other benefits I'll talk about in a minute. So this gets back to goals. What kind of goals do you want to have for if you're going to set up camp somewhere? What do you want to do during the day? And that should determine your boat choice. For an expedition that will last a week or more, these are just my personal, absolute personal preferences. I swear to God, this is one of the very, very few text-heavy slides. Um, so for me, it's about long and narrow. For me, that means higher hull speed. It means tracking straighter. And most importantly, it means more cargo space. We'll get to this when we get to packing, but when you get to packing, it's a, it's a volume game. You don't have to worry about weight so much like you do when you, when you backpack. But even though we can have these huge boats, they're mostly going to be filled with food and water. And so it's all about maximizing a volume and packable space. Related to that, I also like boats with big hatches. Um, some of you know um, uh, SKL, who just moved here from Chile. He's a Basque member. I've, I've paddled with him a bunch. And he has one of those sweet, sweet rock pool terrans, 
which has almost like surf ski lines and it's long and it's just no rocker and it's fast as hell and it's awesome. That front hatch that has all this volume underneath it, the hatch is like this big. And that would drive me personally crazy. But for him, it's fine. So again, about personal preference. So I like large hatches fore and aft. I happen to own a Tide Race, which has those big oval rear hatches fore and aft. So I don't have to worry about, oh, only the small bags can go up at the front and only the big bags can go in the back. So analyzing how big your hatches are fore and aft can be uh, uh, something to think about. I personally like a rudder for expeditions and for expeditions only. And that is for two very simple reasons. Number one, fewer corrective strokes if I want to make just miles. And um, many people, this is again, super personal preference. But the other uh, thing that's more important for me for camping is that there's no skeg box taking up packable room in the aft of my kayak. So um, I use a skeg boat 99.9% .9 of the time. But when I'm on an expedition, personally, I prefer a rudder. Can't always have that option, but. Um, and then for me and for a lot of other people, I find that uh, for putting miles on every single day, um, yes, it's nice to have a cushy seat and good outfitting. Those are kind of standard for whatever boat you buy. But I really think that uh, uh, thigh support is really important because when you're sitting in a kayak for six to 14 hours a day, depending on what kind of paddle you want to do, um, uh, supporting your own knees uh, with your hamstrings is pretty tiring. So um, uh, this is also where having a uh, pedal float is also really handy because you can partially inflate it, put it underneath your legs and that can really help alleviate some of that muscle strain. Um, so over the years, I've learned a lot from entirely from people in Basque. So this, this is kind of a superset of, or well, actually radical subset of what I've learned from people in Basques. Um, Penny and Ann Kang both taught me very, very well that no dry bags should ever go in the tent. And that's because salt can make fabric hydrophilic. And so once salt gets into your tent, it wants to absorb moisture. And then that next really uh, uh, heavy condense condensation day or morning, your tent can be soaked. So what we do is we have just stuff sacks inside of all of our dry bags. And we just dump the, the stuff sacks into the tent and leave the dry bags outside. Um, I'm with Mike Higgins on this one that sand is the enemy. And um, I, I absolutely have found that actually just using the Ikea bags that we most of us use um, to schlep dry bags from your boat to your campsite and back and forth, which by the way is where you'll get most of your exercise on every expedition you ever do. Um, just standing in that dry, in that Ikea bag and using it as a changing mat uh, really reduces the amount of sand that gets in your tent, on your person and on your dry suit. Um, learned this one from Ann Kang. Golf umbrellas are really narrow and really long and they fit perfectly in the front of a, of a boat and or in, in, your, in your front hatch. And when you deploy them, they're like seriously like 70 inches in diameter. And so you could actually pop, drag one, one of those out of your front hatch, pop it, tuck it under your, under your arm and just sit on a beach when it's pouring rain and eat food and be completely dry. So golf umbrellas are kind of awesome for that. Um, we already talked about uh, judging boats by the size of their hatches. Um, I'm a big believer in... in uh, one is none, two is one when it comes to really, really important critical elements like flares, like even multi-tools. So I tend to bring spares of anything that I absolutely can't live without. Um, speaking of multi-tools, I usually bring one or like one standard size and one tiny middle, mini size multi-tool because then I have two pliers to do skeg, uh, uh, repairs or rudder repairs. Um, multi schools are just the best in terms of like weight and volume to how much functionality they, they give. And oh my God, do I love tapered dry bags, uh, which are perfect for going in the very stern or very um, uh, front of your hatch. 
Uh, I learned from a river guide, this term called clown chords. And this is where you put something far in the, in the, in the nose of your, of your front hatch, we'll say. And you attach like a four foot long piece of paracord to it. So that way, when you get there at the end of the day, you just remove a couple of bags and just pull this cord and all the bags behind it just pull out along with it. So attaching clown cords to things that you put in the extreme ends of your uh, kayak can be a really great tool. At the end of the day, you're going to be tired. You're not going to want to F around at all. You want your dry clothes. You want your food. You want your shelter. And this is a great way to just kind of pop all that stuff out as soon as you need it. Uh, so let's talk about food. Uh, pretty sure the only reason I kayak is to eat, pretty much. So um, this image actually has a lot of tips for, um, for uh, uh, preparing food, not the least of which is this uh, bodyboard down in the lower right. And we found that on the beach that we didn't actually bring a bodyboard with us. But um, this is um, a great way to have a shared uh, eating space uh, while letting people pitch tents wherever they, wherever they want. Um, we wound up just using the, uh, the area and what we found around us um, in a, a way that was sustainable and not kind of damaging to the environment. Uh, we wound up uh, bringing several stove types. Stoves are super, super personal. Um, we tend to, for example, uh, dehydrate all of our own food and then bring just a jet boil to rehydrate it. That's how we roll. But others bring white gas and they actually cook fresh meals every single night. Totally, uh, uh, totally personal. And if you're going to have really differing styles like that, Talk about that with your fellow paddlers so you can coordinate and have certain shared meal nights, certain um, uh, solo meal nights. And uh, that way just everyone's fed and on, fed on time and with the appropriate amounts because food is not only morale, food is fuel. And if you are chronically underfueled on an expedition, you will not have a good time. Oh, uh, there was another element actually hold on how do I go backwards I'm not sure another um element here is uh bear canisters we'll talk about critter proofing in a little bit but you'll notice we have a bear canister down in this corner bear canister way up in that corner um basically figure out what is the worst animal you might possibly uh, run into and protect against that animal and then everything else down the food chain is going to be fine um a lot of people on the call probably are is gonna are going to be surprised. I'm not going to talk about booze that much on this call, but you can see that uh, we did bring some wine in a bladder. Boda Box B O T A B O X is absolutely a great brand for just wine in a box in this bag, and it's like when you're outdoors, it tastes awesome. Just trust me on that one. Um, but uh, food tips: we already talked about stoves being really personal. Always, while you're paddling, have snacks at the ready. If you have a glove box hatch right in between your knees, that's a perfect place for this stuff. If you don't, you have to be a little crafty about, is it in your PFD? Is it in the bungees? You just need to make sure that you do not run out of fuel and bonk because then you become a total jerk and you lose all motivation. Your morale goes out the window. And so just eating all the time is really important. Um, I crossed Monterey Bay with Matt Kryzan once, and his rule is every hour on the hour, you hungry, doesn't matter. You stop every hour and have a snack. You stop every hour and you have a drink. And so I think that is a really, really good way to not just make sure you're being honest about food intake. It breaks up the day if you have long crossings. So coming up with rules like that, either 30 or 60 minutes, stop for five minutes, have a have a snack, whatever it takes. Um, force yourself to do it if you're, even if you're not hungry. Um, meals are morale. And if things get tense in your group, seriously, have a shared meal. This will go a long way. Um, again, another Ann Kang special. Uh, she turned us on to using small thermoses about that big and uh, for lunches. So what we do is we'd make breakfast 
heat some extra water, put dehydrated food in a thermos, put boiling water in there and seal it. And then by the time we stop for lunch, we have like a hot noodle dish or a hot soup. And if you're going somewhere where it's really rainy, that thing about food equaling morale, hot food on a cold day is just gonna be, gonna fuel you through the worst conditions for sure. Um, and dehydrators are awesome. We own one. Um, it's a way to make food you can prepare just with boiled water, but you can control the sodium content. You can control the additives. You can control the flavor. We've made pad thai. We've made chili. We've made all sorts of stuff. Um, crab meat, oddly, oddly enough, reconstitutes really well uh, when it's when it's uh, dehydrated. So um, if you don't have a dehydrator, consider it because it's a big expense up front. But if you camp a lot, it might actually pay itself back uh, sooner than you think. We talked a lot about food. We haven't talked about water yet. So water is, is more important than food. And um, I know that uh, like Mike, who's on the call tonight and a lot of others use desalinators. Um, and those are totally appropriate in some circumstances. We don't particularly use them ourselves. Completely personal decision. Not saying that they're bad. I just think they're a pain in the ass. And also, look at my arms. I can't power a desalinator for 45 minutes. A hand, hand pump one. So, um, so for us, fresh water is our number one priority. And that means one of two things. Either you need to bring what you know you need with you, or you think you need it with you, or you need to plan your trip around fresh water sources. So if you go to a place that's fairly wet, like uh, the Pacific Northwest, that's great, but still some streams dry up in the summer. So again, local knowledge, planning ahead, checking the internet, uh, trying to figure out like, is this an, an always running spring? Is this an always running uh, stream that can potentially determine where and how you plan your, your rest stops? Um, and if you do not bring all of your own water, bring a filter. And my personal favorite is the Sawyer Squeeze. It's literally this big. And you put a bag on one side and squeeze the bag through the filter into another container. And it's, since kayaking is all about minimal volume of equipment, man, the Sawyer Squeeze is so awesome. You can buy extra filter packs and they take no space that weighs nothing. And, uh, and it doesn't take that long to process a liter of water. So that's my personal suggestion. But again, all, all personal opinion. So let's talk about packing. This is what I brought for two weeks on Vancouver Island minus food. This does include water, but it doesn't include, well, actually it does include food. The white bags you see in the middle are um, bear proof sacks which are the kinds of things you can't really use in the Sierra because they're not rated for the Sierra, but they were okay for, um, for the Pacific Northwest. So I had to figure out how to get all of these bags into this boat. And the way I did that is through practice, practice packing. It sounds like a horrible way to spend a Saturday because it is, but uh, if you don't do this, uh, it's going to wind up being a, really, really ugly situation at the put-in if you find that everything you want to bring won't fit. Um, and so you can see here, this is why I, for this year, I love that boat because look at the size of those hatches. Super easy to get stuff into. Oh, we'll talk about gear, uh, about dry bag sizes in, in a few minutes. Um, another thing I did, I'm a really visual thinker. So once I did a test pack, I actually made diagrams of how this stuff fit just so I can remember like a puzzle piece, how all these things fit together. And you'll see, I actually wrote like five liter, five liter, 20 liter, 10 liter. I actually wrote the size of the bags that were on there. And this just kind of helped me get a sense for like what my options were in terms of, of packing my kayak. And it helped a great deal. Um, when it comes to how to pack, my personal preference is that your, your needs when you land are at the top closest to the hatch. So that means if it's the end of the day, that's probably your clothes. Or if it's midday, that's your food. Um, and then your shelter is gonna be probably a very, very close second. So for me, how I pack is largely about having the 
the, the things I'm going to need on shore are the last things I pack because I want them closest to the hatches. Things, of course, that are really heavy, like water, you want to have as low as possible in your kayak so your center of gravity remains low. When you do land and you do unpack, um, establish reliable routines, get into habits, because figuring out, like trying to reconstruct a wheel every single campsite, if you're moving every single day, is a complete pain in the ass, first of all. Second of all, it's robbing you from social time with your paddlers, because that's why a lot of us like to paddle. And it's just expending um, unneeded energy, which is important to conserve on, a, on an expedition. Um, Critter proofing, we talked about a little bit already. Um, if you're gonna encounter bears, bring bear canisters. If you're gonna encounter raccoons, I don't know, bring bear canisters. Um, really think about the worst thing that you're gonna encounter in terms of not just danger, but in terms of intelligence and capability. Like raccoons have opposable thumbs. Who gave raccoons opposable thumbs? I think that's a horrible idea, but um, there they are and they are a complete pain in our ass most of the time. So uh, really think about not just, uh, uh, so always remember to just critter proof your campsite and keep an eye on things at all times. And this, this happens in the weirdest ways. I didn't throw the photo in there, but uh, we actually have a photo of Ellen and Tom and Krista and I on an expedition where a banana slug got into our lunch. And <laughs> so you just gotta always keep in mind that, you know, one little intrusion can make your lunch kind of icky. Um, so let's talk about dealing with loaded boats. Um, this is where Penny Wells obviously has taught most of us in the club a whole lot about a lot of these principles. Uh, you want to pack your boat as close to the waterline as possible. So depending on where you go, sometimes that might be a quarter mile away from your campsite, or it might be 50 feet from your campsite. But the goal is to not load down your boat with your body weight or more in gear and then pick it up by the toggles and move it. If you hear a crack, you're in for a bad time. So um, going along with that, making sure to never load your a loaded boat by the toggles, the handles on the, on the bow and stern is really important. And so uh, what I learned from Penny and others is to use webbing. And so if you have one loaded boat full of gear, lift it with four people. And the way you do that is you put webbing underneath the, um, underneath the boat at the uh, front and rear bulkhead of the cockpit. And you can use really thick webbing. We always bring like two, uh, two inch webbing, I'm gonna say two feet, two inch webbing with us on kayak expeditions because it rolls up and it takes no space. But even if you just have the straps you use for your kayak, uh, what you can do is, uh, this is a nine footer, but a 15 foot length is way better. Um, what you do is you sling this underneath a boat. You have one person on each side and you put the strap over your shoulders like this. So I'm on one side, someone's on the other side, and then everyone lifts with their legs at the same time. And you can load a, uh, carry a ton of weight and it won't hurt your back. And it's a really efficient way to work. Um, and you will always, I find, in my experience, get more exercise from gear schlepping than paddling. Uh, because if you have uh, two IKEA dry bags, you will make a minimum of six trips from your boat to your tent. Um, and so that's where a lot of the he heavy lifting, so to speak, on, a, uh, on an expedition comes from. So that's all I had prepared for tonight, uh, but I'm happy to open it to questions as well as other opinions on any topic that was covered based on um, the experiences of anyone else in the club who's on the call. So what you got? Steve, I don't know if you're going to administer or- I think because I can't, or... because there's so many people, I can't see everybody at once. So just kind of uh, unmute yourself if you wanna share something and kind of barge in, I think at this point. I'm gonna start by barging in. So um, with raccoons in particular, uh, there's nothing like being on Jones Island up in the San Juans on an expedition and it's dark and it's night and you shine your headlamp around and like 30 sets of eyes are looking back at you, which is kind of creepy. 
Uh, so, but I've actually found that the, the raccoons on Tomales Bay can be worse than anywhere else sometimes. So in addition to some of the things people already suggested, including Krista put up on the chat about uh, taking your kayak straps with you, they used to strap it to your car, strap it around your hatch covers. I will also do things like put my spare paddles or both paddles uh, under the bungees across the hatch covers and turn the boat over and let it sit upside down on the hatch covers. And I've had a tamales, my boat right side up, uh, it's two straps on a hatch cover on an oval shaped one and a raccoon pried up one end of the oval hatch cover, reached in, grabbed my Ikea bag and fortunately, he was only able to get the Ikea bag partway out without really getting anything else. But other people who had unfortunately left food in their boat had a mess. Yeah, um, to, to that point, um, uh, definitely carrying, uh, carrying the straps that you use to secure your, um, your, car, uh, your kayak to your car are a great tool for that. Um, hands up if you don't know what the term surf wrap means anyone heard the term surf wrap okay so uh what what um what steve is talking about um is like like putting additional uh barriers in front of the hatch for critters to pre prevent them from getting in and one way to uh make it uh even harder is to do what's called a surf wrap so here's a here's a bungee and uh here is say a paddle shaft and what you do is you just you just take the paddle shaft and you wrap it around the bungee so it creates a loop around the paddle shaft. And that's called a surf wrap. And that's used by a lot of us who do kayak surfing to secure spare paddles, to secure uh, um, uh, pumps to our front deck so that a big wave won't just wash it off. And so that's another good technique to kind of like secure something to your deck to get it in the way between Hungry Critter and your tasty, tasty chocolate. Questions, tips? Nathan, I have a question for you about um, tying down your boats. Um, did I see in the picture, were you guys using your um, your tow belts to tie down your boats? Is that a, is that a good idea? <laughs> Beth asks an excellent question. Yes, we were using our tow belts. Um, and I, I think it's, it's one of those principles I learned from ultralight backpacking, which is like bring one thing that can be used in a bunch of different scenarios. And tow belts are great for stuff like that. So uh, most tow belts are, when fully extended, 30 to 50 feet long. So that gives you plenty of length to wrap around a tree, um, you know, click into another tow belt to extend length. And uh, because when you're on land, you're not going to be using them for anything else during that time because you're not on the water. So yeah, we, use our, we used our, uh, our uh, tow belts a lot to kind of secure our boats overnight. As far as packing, I found that uh, I could take a photograph like you had of where everything went, you know, line it up against where the kayak is, take a photograph of it, print it up, carry it around with me, and uh, I don't have to have a diagram. All the color totally, yeah. totally. And I, I, I think it's, I, I'm, a, I'm a really poor 3D thinker. So for me, like having a photograph, having a diagram, like if I don't, if I don't do that, I'll never remember how all that crap fit into my boat like two days ago. I will have no idea. And so a photograph is a great idea, like having it in parallel with your boat. And I love that tip. That's awesome. Um, I, oh, another thing uh, that I didn't mention is dry bag size. Um, lots of people here will probably disagree with me, but I think anything over 20 liters is idiotic in yep. terms of trying to fit it <laughs> because it won't go in the hatch. It's so big, it's gonna have all this excess air. And even if it means taking my tent and separating the fly from the tent from the poles, I will never have anything bigger than a 20 liter dry bag in my boat. Um, that also means that you might wind up having a lot of five to 10 liter bags. And that's why schlepping becomes kind of a thing. Um, also, if you have a kayak with a 
you know, carbon fiber wrap on the inside. So the interior of your kayak is black. Yeah, maybe don't buy black dry bags. I've... <laughs> I've lost I've lost gear for four months because literally there was a kayak, there was a bag in the ass end of my kayak that I didn't see. So yellow's good. Red's good. May I uh, talk about um, uh, desalinizers for a minute? <laughs> go for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I uh, used to go to Baja a lot, which is a desert, and there are very, 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 very few places to get water. And for example, it takes uh, about two weeks, uh, a lot less if you're not if you're not exploring, to uh, paddle around uh, the Guardian Angel Island, and it's a wonderful place that I recommend you go to. But the first time I did that, I carried thirteen four liter bags, uh, recycled mm. wine bags of water mm. in my boat. Because they say, you know, a liter a day, a 14 day trip. Uh, and I uh, use a little bit less than that. And so I brought 13 wine bags was the most I could fit along with all of my gear. And then uh, uh, on it, Guardian Angel Island, several trips later, I ran into a guy named John Weed, who's a Bay Area uh, <laughs> personality. <laughs> and he had a desalinizer and he told wonderful stories about why he used it. And I'll save those for another time. But when he brought out his desalinizer, he hugged it to his chest like a teddy bear. And he said, this prevents me from having to do stupid things. I love it. And so since then, I've used uh, a, uh, the, a desalinizer, the uh, Sur Survivor 35 is the name of it. It's like 18 uh, inches long. It has a long arm and it's really not that hard to pump. The hard part about it is, is that it's, uh, it's a repetitive motion that, that your, your arm gets tired. And so I've been joking about doing an exercise book that shows uh, putting it between your knees and using your legs to provide the energy and using your right arm and then using your left arm. And in the exercise book, we'd have uh, Marianne Ferda uh, draw diagrams about which muscle we're exercising when we're using it that way. And a trick that um, that John Weed taught us was that, oh, you know, 45 minutes to an hour, you know, you're just going to be, be bored out of your tears. He says, no, I think of it as a meditative thing. I go down to the beach late in the day and I watch the sun go down while I make another four liters of water. And then he's good for another whole day. So I think the desalinizers work amazingly well. They're also much more reliable than you've heard. Uh, and, uh, and uh, I did bring one with me to uh, Alaska and British Columbia a few times, and I was sorry I did. And uh, so that's just uh, the, the wrong environment for it. But, but Baja is the perfect mm. place for a desalinizer. And, and to follow up on that, Mike, I, uh, are you still using um, the surplus ones that you got? Or did you get a new, did you buy them new? Um, well, that, I guess that's a trick that if you're thinking about buying one, uh, watch eBay for a while. The Survivor 35s, the Navy uh, puts one in every uh, lifeboat on every uh, boat in the fleet. And then every, I forget what it is, every 10 years, they throw them all away and put new ones in, even if they've never been used once. And so when I bought mine, uh, I got it for, well, you, you can get them as low as, as uh, $200 uh, on eBay. They, they list at, you know, uh, $2,995.99. So they're very expensive to buy new. But for, for a fraction of that cost, for $200, you can get one on eBay. And I was concerned that, you know, if I buy one of those, uh, it's going to be, uh, it's not going to work. So I bought one. And when I, when I got it, it had a maintenance tag on it that that said it had uh, it had a maintenance tag that said every year you're supposed to run it for an hour and run this chemical through it to kill any uh, uh, algae, and the maintenance tag had been filled out once 13 years ago and then it had been <laughs> ignored. So it's like 12 years of being ignored. I'm sure the filter is going to be dried out, and I but I before I bought a new filter which is like $300. I went down to a beach. I pumped it for 15 minutes and it made a liter of water. It worked to factory specifications after being ignored for 12 years. And, uh, 
it has gotten slower over the years. I'm probably sucking silt or something into it. So it's not as fast as it used to be. And, and I might uh, be willing to, uh, to stick a, a new filter in it uh, one of these days. But I've used it on like six or eight trips to Baja and it has worked perfectly. Uh, there are some maintenance issues. There's a plastic part that can crack. As a matter of fact, it broke off on uh, Doug Hamilton. And so he called up the manufacturer when he got home and he ordered like four uh, sets of spares and he gave me one, he replaced his, and he always carries a spare of that plastic hinge now when, whenever he goes uh, to Baja. Nice. Thanks uh, for that, that, uh, that info. That's all super helpful, Mike. Is that slight, uh, Steve? A slight counter to that. Uh, my nephew used a, um, when he was in Baja, going around Guardian Angel Island doing his winter circumnavigation, he brought a desalinator. And what they found was that the water that came through uh, was a bit salty. So they said they preferred not to drink the water. They used the water. They carried 13 gallons a person uh, with them. And instead they used it just for cooking because, it was because of the saltiness. Yeah. So maybe they had a bad filter or a cracked part or something, but he didn't, he, he never seemed to find that. And uh, one, one thing that I think was in the slides, but I, that I didn't call out is that if anyone um, wants to haul their, does make the decision to haul their water with them, kind of the de facto standard is the MSR dromedary. Um, and we own like six of them at, or eight of them or something <laughs> like that. And um, they're kind of the de facto standard. <laughs> Mike, Mike brags he only owns four. Um, and uh, uh, those are those are really great. And I've used those all over the place. Um, and those are, those are really handy. They come with different spigots for based on however you want to set up your camp. And so those are those are kind of the go to standards. Oh, oh, a, uh, an MSR dry bag trick is that the cap on the uh, that's cap that doesn't have a spigot is exactly the same as the cap on a Nalgene water bottle. So I Ooh. went so I went to REI and bought four red ones. So my dromedary bags have red caps and everyone else has black caps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 pretty weird when you get to a campsite and like everyone has yellow sea line dry bags and you're like, "Oh crap, where's my stuff?" And so like having that stuff like color coded is actually a great tip. I was curious if you use a down bag or a synthetic sleeping bag. Oh, Marianne, great question. Depends on where you go. And also depends a little bit on kind of your personal pack, uh, camping style. Um, I usually prefer down for volume reasons because it just packs up super tight. I got to admit, we were in Vancouver Island and there were a couple of days my dry, my, uh, my down bag never dried. And it wasn't because of personal error. It was just ambient humidity levels. So I have, I, I have one of each. Um, so I'm, I'm fortunate to have one of each, but uh, if I'm going somewhere dry, I always bring down. And if I'm going somewhere super wet, I always bring synthetic. Um, I also have moved from using um, uh, sleeping bags to quilts. So I have a down quilt and a, um, and a synthetic quilt. Uh, and, and for most of the time, that's fine. And like half the time I'm sleeping in my kayaking clothing to dry it out from my own body heat overnight. So that actually winds up, winds up being a, a, a system that's worked okay for me, but you know, one's, one's individual, uh, Mileage may vary. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Speaking of, oh, James had a question. Yeah, James first. James has answered the question. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Mike. Um, I just stuck it in the in the chat too. Can you talk about electronics, Nathan? I know you can, but will you? <laughs> um, do you schlep? I hate electronics. What are you talking about? <laughs> <I> know, <right? laughs> Do you bring that beast of a of a tool with you when you go? Uh, yeah, it's no, but um, uh, you know, solar powered stuff. What do you? What's your preference? Um, that's a great question. I am not the person to talk about solar powered stuff. Um, I've tried it, but there's a few issues that I've run into it into with it. One is um, while you're kayaking, if it's a beautiful day, you should have sun on your back deck all the time 
And um, that is, I would argue, the only reason to ever get those clear vinyl dry bags, which stick to everything and they're impossible to pack and I freaking hate them. But um, it would, you know, those things do allow sunlight in, but they do attenuate the amount of sunlight that comes in. And so I have not had a great, uh, I've not had great experiences uh, with those really charging up the devices that I bring, such as GPSs, audio field recorders, uh, cameras, stuff like that. So I find I found that it's just easier for me to just bring warehoused, fully charged um, uh, rechargeables with me, and making choices in my gear that allows me to have multiple batteries for whatever gear I'm bringing. Yeah. Um, do you have so a little I'm high not, end generator or something? I feel like I feel like that's an electronics version of a desalinator. It feels like too much work to me. <laughs> um, those those can work, but the amount of voltage those things put back into batteries is is not that much based on the effort. Um, so my my personal approach for for trips up to two weeks, I have not done an expedition over two weeks, so that's a big caveat. Um, but up to two weeks, I just bring spares and it's just so much easier because like when I get to camp, I kind of want to just hang out and eat and be social as opposed to sit there and hand crank this loud thing where people are like, I can't actually have a conversation with you doing that. Go over there. So, but that's just my personal take on it. Thanks. It is becoming more difficult over time to find devices that have replaceable batteries. So I bring a battery bank these days. Mm. And so I have two of them that are about the size of a, of a Betamax uh, uh, cassette. Uh, and, uh, and one of them will recharge a, uh, a VHF radio and a, uh, and a, and a camera for, uh, for uh, you know, at least a week. So two of them has been the most mm -hmm. that, I, that I needed uh, for that sort of thing. And if you're lucky and you stop uh, places on the way, you can immediately plug your, your battery bank back in and charge them back up again. And yeah. not, not only is that a fabulous, fabulous uh, piece of advice, which I do as well, I... Abs this is why I, I love Mike because I love the fact he used a Betamax uh, <laughs> videotape as a size reference. Oh my God, that's hilarious. But I'm, I, I was going to suggest you explain what a Betamax is. <laughs> that's, that's a whole other okay. webinar, Steve. It's, it's so, a little bit smaller than a VHS cassette then. Does that work for you? <laughs> I had a, a comment about uh, moving the boats to the water and uh, a trick that I use, uh, which, which requires only one person, what a coincidence, is uh, I dog sled uh, the boat up and down the beach, which is I tie a, a long, uh, what the same cord I tie the boat to a tree with, I tie it around my waist and then leaning way over, I can drag the boat down to the beach without having to pick it up by the toggle and risk breaking it and drag it up the beach as well, mostly loaded. Sometimes I'll take the water out first, uh, stuff like that. But um, of course, I also have a, uh, a plastic boat. Uh, that's my preference is to always have a plastic mm. boat because then I don't mind dragging it over the rocks to uh, get it above high tide line. Unless there's barnacles on the rocks, then I pick the poor thing up. But uh, that, that's, that's why I uh, prefer a, a, a tough plastic boat like a, a Prion Kodiak for an expedition. Yep, that's a great point. Actually, I, I, I saw that PH has this new boat called the Valkyrie, which is like a really long expedition dolphin, which is kind of compelling. Um, so like plastic boats for, for expeditions definitely makes you just sweat a lot less stuff for sure. Um, and actually another expedition that I, we did in sea kayaks, but on a river was we actually uh, went upstream on the Colorado with uh, a bunch of people on this, on this call actually. And we, yet again, uh, a great use for tow ropes. We would, we were attaining. So we were trying to go against the main flow, which means we're just eddy hopping the whole way. And sometimes we get to these places where it's too shallow to literally put your paddle in. So we just hop out use our tow belts, clip them, keep wearing them, clip them right into our own boats and then just like walk our boats around whatever corner we had to get across. So, you know, again, back to Beth's question, like, and, and Mike's answer, um, tow belts are, tow belts and paddle floats 
I would argue are like the two things that you would never think you'd use that that often, but with those resources nearby, they can just be incredibly handy. I have one thing, uh, like in terms of, um, you know, getting dressed and undressed, you were talking about never bring anything salty inside the tent. My approach is a little bit different. Uh, okay. Just uh, because, especially if you move every night, um, and if the weather is not nice, it's a lot of moisture in there in early morning or it's raining. Uh, which I have one of the IKEA bag, uh, which is only for salty stuff, and uh, other IKEA bags, which is uh, uh, for everything else. So the one the IKEA bag for salty stuff, uh, one thing I do, I go in the tent and I strip my uh, my dry suit and I put it inside. So anything that is salty goes inside that bag. Uh, that what allows me in the morning when I wake up, I just do the opposite. I put my dry suit and then I leave the tent. So basically I'm never wet. When I go outside, I already have a dry suit on and I can take the tent down, it's wet or whatever. But that's one way to uh, still have a luxury of, uh, uh, so I, I tend to bring everything in the tent actually, the food, the, uh, you know, just for security and have a boat next to the tent. <laughs> so, but that's gotcha. a different uh, approach. But Franca brings up a really important point, which is like, what is, what's, what, and it doesn't sound that important because we're all in our homes and comfortable, but like when the weather is really crappy, like when do you make the decision to, to disrobe from your paddling gear into your dry, dry, uh, uh, shore gear. And that's, that's tricky sometimes. And so there's a lot of good arguments to be made about like you land and maybe the first thing on shore that you unpack should be your shelter rather than your yeah. clothes because if it's really yeah if it's really crappy just keep wearing your paddling clothes and let them get rinsed a little bit set everything up and then do the transition into into land wear so yeah that's a really really good point nathan speaking of shelters in addition to tents a lot of people use tarps do you want to talk about that a bit um setting them up how you use them what they're good for briefly but then i'll turn it back over to the group uh i don't use tarps for my personal shelter uh, i use tarps for kind of uh uh for covering camp uh camp kitchen areas or shared areas every once in a while we do pitch an extra tarp over our tent if it's if the weather's just going to be extra extra bad or, or super intense um but i tend to use a tent most of the time uh, pro tip about tents, though, we actually got, we searched and searched and found the tent that had the least amount of mesh, which sometimes makes it uncomfortable, but that means the, the fabric walls are higher, so if it's really windy, you get less spin drift of sand blowing into your tent if the fabric walls are higher, um, which we found to be convenient. Um, and because we use... Um, uh, but we don't use tents for personal shelter, but uh, sorry, we don't use tarps for personal shelter. But if anyone else on the meeting does, it'd be interesting to hear their perspective, though. I was really thinking about not for not instead of tents, but for example, like for cooking areas. And if you're out in a lot of rain, it gives you some place to sit while you're eating. Uh, it, yeah. You know, instead of having to sit out in the rain. Yeah. Uh, Ellen had a point to make. Yeah, so um, after that trip that we were on with Krista and Nathan and Anne, Anne had that Megalite, which was that blue and white thing you saw us sitting under eating. And we went out and bought one. And that's usually the first thing we put up when we get to land, if it's raining. We put that up and then we bring all our stuff off the, off the boats and stick it under that. And then we put up tarps for the tarp, tarp. For our, a tarp for our tent. And then we set up the tent under the tarp and then we put stuff into the tent and the tent stays relatively dry and all the stuff that we put in the tent is dry. And the advantage of having a tarp also is then you can have stuff kind of stored around your tent that's not getting super sop sopping wet. Mm -hmm. But that does not work if you have a lot of wind. 
Yes. So if, if we're setting up in the woods someplace protected, that's great. If we're in a place that's really windy, then the tarp over the tent just doesn't work. Mm. And that's a, a great point. If you're going to use a tarp, remember that a lot of tarps um, are designed to use poles or hiking poles. We all have paddles. So again, it's like a multi-use thing. If you can you, you know, put your paddles to extra use when you're on land because you're not using them on the water, that can be, uh, that can be really, really handy. Another thing that's really great about a tarp is that it collects water. And so you mm. can collect fresh water from it and then um, boil it and drink it. Yeah, boil it, just drink or it. Or just drink it. Yeah. We actually collected quite a bit of water on our last trip using our tarp. Mm. I have a, uh, a Noah's tarp, which is a parabolic hyperbola. It's supposed to shed the wind, at least not fall down. But of course, the wind can blow in the big open ends. But I made some special uh, slip covers to put over the ends of my paddles. So I have two paddles holding up the, uh, the two ends. And then the other two ends are staked straight down. But uh, I use a, a Noah's tarp uh, as a dry place to... to, to, to uh, um, uh, to, to unpack stuff. For example, I set the, the Noah's tarp up on a rainy day. Then I, I relax under it. I set my tent up and the inner tent stays dry. I put the rain fly on the tent and I stick it halfway out of the tarp. And now I have a huge vestibule. If there's someone else with me, then they set their tent up inside the Noah's tarp out of the rain. And then they push theirs out the other end. And you can sometimes fit three or four tents with one communal area in the middle for cooking in and, and socializing until uh, until it's time to go to bed instead of all hiding in your tents and not being able to talk to each other. Yeah. When, when I was, I did an expedition in New Zealand where we had like, we basically made this gigantic tarp corridor <laughs> of like two or three tarps of just like this big long thing. There's no headroom at all, but uh, being able, to, I, I think Mike uh, kind of in Mike's, statement is wrapped up i think a really important point is that when we paddle together most of the time is to be social and no one's going to have any fun if we're all in our individual tents being miserable in the rain so finding ways to to always kind of break those barriers and be social uh and laugh at the conditions you find yourself in is is really important to uh and i think part and parcel to having a good time If you use uh, if you use tarps down in Baja, you better get some really good sand anchors. I've seen uh, I've just seen these things blow out of the sand, you know. So they use uh, little plates down there. They bury them about a foot and a half deep and stomp the sand around them. Most of the time it works, and so sometimes they just become missiles. Nathan, there's a question in the chat from Cindy which is, what do you do about putting away wet gear? For example, your tent, is it okay stowed for a day of paddling or does it ever get mildew? Mm. That's a good question, actually. Um, Tom and Ellen have done more paddling in really wet conditions than I have, um, but I have not found it, during, during the course of an expedition, I haven't found it to be an issue. Um, if you don't, then unpack it and dry it and clean it and everything afterwards, you're asking for hurt. But for me, for a week or two, it's been fine. But Tom and Ellen, do you guys have a, have you found anything differently? So yeah, for a week or two, it's fine. Just make sure that when you get back, that thing's gotta be bone dry before you actually like roll it up and store it permanently. Uh, the yeah, we do. You know, we try to keep our tent relatively dry by having it on their tarp. And so the one thing we're packing that's really wet is the tarp. And tarps, right. as soon as it stops raining, the tarp dries out really fast. And so that's a big advantage. The tent yep. can take a lot longer to dry out. Yeah. And it's also important to, to remember that you don't always have to pack the tent with the fly with the tarp. These can all be completely uh, in different dry bags which keeps the dry, per dry bag sizes small, which makes packing easier. So always consider that too. I, uh, my first trip on the Alaskan ferry, I was fortunate to have Joe Petalino along with me. And on our way home, he warned me that the trip on the ferry is too long. 
when you get on the ferry, you unpack your tent, even if you're not going to sleep in it, you set it up and you let it dry out under the, the, the sunroof uh, on the back of the ferry so that when you get home, it's already dry and you're all done. And it doesn't mildew in those two or three days before you get home. Another thing that I found useful is to uh, pull some lines inside the tent and the uh, laundry tags. So mm. basically, I tend to sweat a lot paddling. So then I dry all my stuff. So I have like a laundry inside the tent. Oh my god! I'm so glad you brought that up. Like like laundry lines yeah. for both inside and outside. Inside, oh, uh, tons lifesaver. That is such yeah. a good tip. Yeah. Such a good tip. Actually, if, if for, you... for underwear, it's really actually a good idea to stick it in the sleeping bag with you if you're not too cold, because your body heat dries things in the bag. And I've found that stuff dries better in the bag with me than it does hanging in the tent over me where all my breath accumulates and everything. Uh, I guess it depends also how wet it is, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, it's 8.16, folks. I'm probably going to bounce. Uh, you guys can keep the conversation going if you like. Um, this has been great. I've learned a ton from the ensuing discussion, and a lot of people here have added a, a, a ton to the, the very basic stuff that I just laid down. So thank you all for, for being here. I'm going to leave you in the hands of Steve. Unless, Steve, you've got anything else for me? Uh, no, thank you, Nathan. That was fantastic, as expected. Um, so that's great. And if, if people want to stay and share a few more tips, maybe we'll stay till 830 and then shut down. I'm sure there's some really odd personal uh, preferences that we all have. I'll share one, uh, something I won't go expeditioning without after Nathan leaves. So we're going to let Nathan go. <laughs> You're just going to make me Zoom bomb you in five minutes with drawings of penises. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank anyway, you. Thank uh, you everyone for taking the time tonight. I hope that was helpful and it's great seeing so many of you which I haven't seen in in an annoyingly long time so it's really nice to see all those friendly faces so take care everybody yeah bye um so one one tip I'm going to share is I won't go on an expedition especially in cold weather again without bringing dishwashing gloves because uh I was on a trip with some of the people who are actually on the call uh seven of us went to paddle um the largest backcountry lake in the United States in Yellowstone. And there was a lot of dishwashing because the person who was cooking for us made great meals, but they involved pots and pans and so on. So she cooked and we washed dishes. It was cold enough to snow on us several times. So I found that washing dishes uh, with cold water and soap and cold hands, the, all my fingertips started cracking, which is really not fun when you're on uh, uh, in cold weather on a trip where you're paddling. So next time I am going to bring dishwashing gloves and I think that would make me a whole lot happier for the entire trip. I have a question for Tom. Tom, you mentioned uh, in the chat, bringing a cockpit cover and um, I'm gonna share one use of it then I'd like you to talk about others. That same trip in Yellowstone, we had to do what Nathan described of dragging our kayaks up a stream where it got shallow. And one of the valuable things about having a cockpit cover is the water tended to be a little bit bouncy. And as you're dragging it, water can go into the cockpit. So with having a cockpit cover, you can keep your cockpit dry while we are dragging it up. Tom. Um, I always bring a cockpit cover um, and cover my cockpit every night. Um, sometimes it's just keeping rain out, but, but also <laughs> I've discovered um, that if I don't put the cockpit cover on one night, I come back and my kayak is like full of amphipods full, but... and, and I'm like trying to chase them all around the cockpit and they're jumping and they're, you know, and so I, I realized I really like having a cockpit cover. <laughs> it doesn't happen everywhere, but um, they, they don't take up much space and, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's worth having. And then often we will keep all of our kayaking gear, you know, our boots, our dry suits, uh, all the exterior kayaking gear, the wet, the spray skirt and everything, we just keep it stuffed in the cockpit and don't ever bother to hang it out to dry or anything. Because Unless we get a really warm sunny day. Unless there's a really warm sunny day, but mostly we just leave everything stuffed in the cockpit and that's just less stuff to have to deal with out camping. 
Anybody else have any um, unique tips? Yeah, things that I, they... I had a question. Um, Ava. Yeah, we haven't kayak camp before. What would be local places where after you camp, then you could also hike the next day if we wanted to? Um, Gamalas Bay. Right. Okay. North Blue Gum Beach is really nice. You can bushwhack up to the to the ridge and then hike out to the point. Angel okay. Island. Oh, okay. Yeah, true. Mm -hmm. And in, in the past, we've sometimes gone on Lake Sonoma. It's not so much a, a big hike, but we've gone up to the kind of, you, you get as far as you can kayaking, then you walk the rest of the way. There's a waterfall. Uh, Jan one time decided to climb up the waterfall. So there's lots of entertaining things you can do there too. Out of here. <laughs> and uh, if you're bringing your hiking boots, uh, I always bring a hiking boot boots with me to Baja, partly because I can go hiking in them uh, in the desert and they're a, an absolute must. But also if I'm forced to land on a sandy beach, a pair of boots is a way to prevent the sand from getting into your feet and your socks. And so mm -hmm. I'll leave the boots in the vestibule at night when I go to pee, I'll, I'll slip the boots on without tying them to walk out in the sand. And even it's like one of the first things I do after my tent is set up is I put my boots on and then I feel safe from the sand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Tom. So I have a question for Franca and Mike. Um, they have done a lot of trips where you're, um, you're going, you're, you're breaking camp every day. You're, you're trying to cover a lot of miles. Um, Mike has done all these long trips and uh, Franca has paddled with Freya who you know, goes around you know, islands like Australia and North America. Um, and you know, she's covering huge numbers of miles and becoming really efficient. Okay, um, and I'm just curious how 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 does your um, how is that kind of expedition different from what Nathan and we have been talking about? For me, it was um, uh, first of all the gear. I don't have a lot of doubles of everything, just the, the essential stuff. So everything is uh, quite. Uh, it's almost. It's just the safety stuff that is, is double, everything else I make do. Um, first thing is the shelter. Basically you're spending so much hours on the water, you're paddling maybe 10 hours straight. So the first thing I want to do is the shelter to have a shelter and be out of the elements. Um, I was explaining uh, the basically uh, stripping myself inside the tent. Uh, so I bring my dry suit in the tent and the first thing I do after I wake up is put in my dry suit. So every time I'm putting down the tent or I'm uh, putting the tent up, I'm already all suit up. So there is no contamination of my clothes with wetness, sand or anything like that. And uh, I think the most important thing is while you're paddling uh, is um, uh, really stretching, uh, quite often, eating quite often, drinking quite often, peeing quite often. So basically you're keeping your body uh, hydrated and well-fed all the time. So you're basically snacking, having lunch, eating every less than two hours apart and stretching, you know, stretching your tendons, stretching. In that way, you're actually able to cover way much more territory. And uh, uh, by the time you get to wherever you want to get, uh, you're not overtired. Uh, so it's not like pushing it. It is not pushing it. It's not like trying to go as fast as you can, uh, but it's basically pacing yourself through the day. Um, Yeah, I like that uh, that thought about pacing yourself that uh, when I know I'm going to have to paddle all day long, I don't paddle really hard. And also, unlike some people like uh, uh, Freya, uh, I uh, will hug the shore anyway. Uh, I, I know I want to make miles, but I still want to see the view. And paddling in between the rocks and paddling past a, a, a steep cliff uh, just 
uh, feeds my energy and and makes it possible for me to keep going. And so, cutting from point to point is 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 not necessary to uh, to make a, a long uh, distance uh, in uh, in a day. And of course, um, uh, the, the one thing to worry about is: Do you have a good forward stroke? And I took a forward stroke class in Basque decades ago. And then uh, when I go on Basque paddles, people are always saying, I don't think your uh, torso is rotating enough. And so I'm always working on my forward stroke. I think, I hope it's gotten better and better over the years. And, uh, and that just gives me the knowledge that I can get in a kayak and paddle for 10 hours and know that I won't be exhausted at the end of the day. Uh, I, I have a correction to do with Freya actually it was all about getting through the rocks. It's not going point to point. Ah, it's a completely different. It's all a really exploratory nook and crannies you find. So, um, but the thing is, uh, I think is also uh, depending on the distance. Uh, um, you like you're planning your trip if you're doing long distance. Uh, uh, basically, you're looking where uh, possible landing site. And uh, when you're doing long distance, you're going past uh, headlands, you know, the weather can change, wind can change. So you always have to have a safe harbor, whatever is the safe harbor. And the safe harbor is basically one place that you know you can reach within a day. So like for us it was probably no more than 45, 50 miles. You know, if it was more than that, that's no safe harbor then you want to make sure that you have a really amazing uh, uh, weather window. Uh, so I don't know. I think it's really, it's a completely different type of plan, uh, trip in a way, how you do it. I uh, took a, a couple of notes. Nathan said something about finding a tent with the least amount of mesh. And uh, what that's called is a four season tent. And they're, they're actually very hard to find these days. If you buy a four season tent, you can get inside it and you can zip all of the mesh panels closed. And, uh, or you can zip only the ones on the windy side. And it's important to have some ventilation, of course, because your breath will condense inside. But uh, I refuse to buy anything else except a four season tent. And I had another note about, um, about uh, sand, and that is that I bring a whisk broom with me, uh, and I call it Professor Egan's unpatented sand removal tool. And, and when you do get some sand in your tent, you can sweep it out with the broom. You can use it to knock the sand off of your boots before you move them into the vestibule and stuff like that. And it's a tool that I've found uh, really uh, useful. And if Don Fleming is still here, uh, Nathan had a trick uh, about putting a, uh, a bag in the bow in the stern of your boat that is tied to a, to a uh, he called it a clown string. Well, I've been doing that for years because Don Fleming taught me, I'm surprised he hasn't mentioned this, that you always put your flask full of rum in the bow of the boat for luck. And that is the, the, the flask that has a string attached to it. So I can jerk on that and all the small things tumble down and, and get within reach in, the, uh, in the, uh, the front hatch of my boat. Uh, 151. Oh, well, if you don't know, 151 rum is uh, something that Safeway sometimes sells. And it is rum that is 151 proof, meaning it's 75% alcohol, which means, according to Don, you can use it to sterilize your hands and your internals with one product. <laughs> but the important part about 151 rum is it's dehydrated rum for, for campers. And so you can bring one liter of 151 rum and then dilute it with water and make your one flask of rum last for two weeks instead of just lasting the first couple of days. I think that might be a good note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, I want to thank everybody for coming. This was a uh, great fun uh, and um, come back next week. We are going to have 
Jan Dolzer talking about uh, an introduction to rock gardening. So that should be It's fun. also, it's Steve's birthday today. Happy birthday, Steve. Happy birthday, Happy birthday to you. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Steve. Happy birthday, Happy birthday to you. To you. <laughs> Always fun trying to sing on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> okay, everybody. Thanks again. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.